a gentleman with me named Dan Charnas who wrote this lengthy book um, and he's got some amazing stories. Um, I just wanted to give you a little of his background but maybe actually I should have you talk about how you how you got into the business. Oi. Oi. Um, hi. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's really an honor uh, to be here um, with Steve and uh, to hear some of the other people who were in this chair before me. Um, so it's very humbling. Um, I got into the business because when I was in college, when I was your age in the late 1980s, I realized that hip hop was more than just another genre of music or even subgenre, you know, of like the R&B and funk that I grew up listening to in suburban uh, Maryland. Um, it was, I, I felt like it was going to be the most important culture of our time um, because it was, it was not only fun and funny, but it was, it could also be political. It could, uh, it could make you think, it made you dance, it did everything. Um, and so I, I, always having a sort of a closeness growing up to black culture, uh, I just wanted to do anything I could to be a part of that business. Um, and so when I graduated from Boston University where I went to college, um, I had done a, a thesis on racial segregation in the music industry, uh, which was very, very segregated at that time. Um, and we'll talk about that a little later. And the thesis was called Musical Apartheid in America. And because of that thesis, I actually got a chance to meet and interview a lot of people who were in the business. And it were those folks who I met who actually soon became mentors for me in the business. But my first job in the business um, after sending out resumes was working in the mailroom of a company called Profile Records, which was the home of Run DMC um, at the time, and Rob Bass and Special Ed, a lot of like golden era rappers. And um, while I was there, one of the people who I had met through writing this college thesis, a guy named Bill Stephanie, he had co-founded a group called Public Enemy. And the man who had hired him at Def Jam, where he worked, was a guy named Rick Rubin. Uh, and Rick Rubin was co-founder of Def Jam with Russell Simmons, a very, uh, who eventually became a, a very famous record producer. And Rick, uh, after having left Def Jam, was looking to get back into it. And he asked Bill if he knew someone. And that someone, luckily, was me. So I ended up going to work for Rick Rubin in Los Angeles at the age of 24, 25, um, became vice president of rap A&R for like this rap god, basically. The guy who had found LL Cool J, who found and produced the Beastie Boys, and I was working for him. It was insane. Um, and the first record we had together was a record called Baby Got Back by Sir Mix-a-Lot. And yes, I was at that video shoot. And yes, it was everything and more. It, and more. Um, especially more. Uh, and I was out in LA for many, many years. I came back to New York in 2004, uh, 2005, and got my master's in journalism with the thought that I might write something about. Um, at first, I thought, well, I would write about, you know, sort of that first generation of uh, guys who took a chance. Uh, at putting out hip hop records, but then I decided, well, why not take the broadest possible uh, approach and just write about the entire evolution of the business, like Fred Goodman wrote uh, about uh, the birth of the rock business. Um, so that was the genesis of the big payback. I started it in 2007. Um, that, well, it actually started as a magazine. I did for a magazine article in 1999, and I started doing interviews then, but I put, put it back on the shelf, but 2007 to 2010, about three and a half years of straight work on the book. Um, also working a full-time job while doing that um, and getting married and having a kid and all that. So that's, that's the big payback. But the, the number one reason I, I wrote the book, I think, was something deeper than wanting to just tell a story about music or tell a story about the music business or tell a story about hip hop. I wanted to show how hip hop changed America in, over the course of 30 years and how the hip hop generation, the generation that was influenced by hip hop, that grew up on hip hop, changed America. 
and that's why the book ends with the election of Barack Obama. Um, so that's, that's my story. That's why, how I got here. He's a little modest. He's leaving out a few things. Uh, <clears throat> he, um, he graduated Phi Beta Kappa from BU. Okay. And then he went on and got his master's degree from Columbia University's um, Graduate School of Journalism where he won a Pulitzer Traveling Fellowship. Um, he's won several awards um, for writing and whatnot. So aside from being a nice guy and very knowledgeable, he's one of these really smart guys too. Um, why don't you tell me what you currently do though? Right, because Radio One would be very unhappy if I didn't announce that's, that. That's correct. Here. We don't want to make them unhappy. That's right. Um, I am currently the uh, editorial director for uh, news and entertainment for uh, Interactive One, uh, a division of Radio One, which is the largest black-owned media company in the world. And talk about the websites. Oh, right. The websites. Yes. NewsOne.com and TheUrbanDaily.com. Visit them. Love them. Tweet them. Like them. Okay. So... Um, I want to start off with and, and the fact that uh, Professor Quick is here. It kind of uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, believe it or not, there was a point in time where American commercial broadcast radio um, was not open and supportive of this new genre of music. It's not new anymore. Um, <coughs> and um, Dan, being the scholar and uh, the, his, the historian he is, has put together a little presentation on... Um, how hip hop conquered music radio, yep. uh, or the desegregation of radio. Right. So I figured that might be a good starting point for this evening's festivities, and I thought um, he's put this presentation together, so maybe we will take it again to write it together. Excellent. Cool. So again, this book covers uh, a 40-year period from 1968 to 2008 from the first time a guy named DJ Hollywood picks up a microphone and rhymes into it in Harlem to election night in Harlem on November 4th, 2008. And it's about what happened between then and now, how this obscure street culture actually became the world's predominant youth pop culture. And it was because of a few people, uh, a, a, a number of people who fought really, really hard to make it happen. There was a lot of resistance, and we're going to talk a little bit about the resistance um, now. Um, so, uh, if you'll indulge me, um, one of the things that hip-hop did, um, and I really actually, another reason I wanted to, to write about hip-hop is to show um, that, to talk a little bit about the, the good things that hip-hop has done. We talk, when we, even people who love hip hop, when we talk about it, we usually talk about, well, how can we fix hip hop? What's wrong with hip hop? Uh, why there's violence and misogyny? And, and all of those things are important to talk about, but I don't really feel we've had an honest discussion about what hip hop actually did do that was positive. And the first thing I can point to is the desegregation of the music business. Um, so. The music business itself was founded and steeped and, and you know, basically got its start in the Jim Crow era. Everybody know what Jim Crow is? The series of laws uh, that basically kept um, America legally segregated for most of the 20th century, um, even after the passage of, uh, of the Civil Rights Act in 1965. So you, just like you had separate facilities down south, um, the music business had separate facilities for, uh, you know, white acts and black acts. So you had record companies and then you had race record companies, which is what they called them back then. You had uh, radio stations and then you had black radio stations that catered to black audiences. And even after, during and after the civil rights movement of the 1950s, this segregated tradition continued. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about what it was like for black artists in the 1950s, say, you know, during the birth of the rhythm and blues slash rock and roll era. Now, the, of course, the ironic thing is, even though you have all this segregation, all of American music is, is, finds its root in African American culture and in African retentions, everything. And I'm, I'm even talking country music, too. When you think of country music, 
What instrument comes to mind that's particularly country music? What I hear, banjo? Banjo is a West African word, right? So even in the Deep South when, uh, you know, sort of country music was, was coming, there, were, there, were, there was a lot of mixture and cultural mixing going on. Um, and yet, through this segregatory tradition, black artists who produced most of the source material for this art found themselves on the outs. So, um, how many people remember a song called Earth Angel by the Penguins? Um, so I wanted to play you a little bit of this song, just so. So this is uh, a black quintet called the Penguins singing Earth Angel. People know the song? All right. So the Penguins put this song out. And its peak position on the pop chart is number eight, even though it's a huge, huge hit, basically a number one hit on black radio. And why? Because, you know, pop radio stations won't play it. But along comes uh, this white Canadian quintet called the Crew Cuts, and their version of Earth Angel goes to number three. And I could have probably come up with more egregious examples of this phenomenon, but if you've ever seen the movie Dream Girls, um, it, that's basically was the inspiration for, for that movie, the sort of the, the dual treatment of black artists and white artists. It basically, um, there was this feeling that uh, white audiences needed this music, this dirty, uh, you know, R&B, black music, translated for them by white artists, cleaned up, if you will, right? So that's the main dynamic of the music business um, for most of the 1950s uh, and into the 1960s. Um, something interesting happens in the 1960s. Things get a little freer, and AM radio in particular, before the age of FM, um, starts to play much, many more black artists. So you could hear James Brown and Aretha Franklin next to the Beatles and the Beach Boys. But then in the 70s, it starts to separate and segregate again. And it's because um, a lot of the independent record labels that black artists were on started to get bought up by major labels. And their catalogs subsumed under what literally they called black departments at these record labels. So, I mean, imagine, you know, you walk into Macy's and there's a black department. But that's what the music business was long after a lot of other American institutions had been desegregated. Same thing for, F, uh, for, for this new burgeoning and lucrative FM radio business. Um, most FM stations had started off as college stations, as free form, free, you know, you could hear Stevie Wonder next to Led Zeppelin, next to Jimi Hendrix, next to Steely Dan, right? But then there was a guy named Lee Abrams, young guy, only 19 years old, a radio nerd, who, who uh, had this idea that if you super serve very, very narrow audiences, then you can boost the ratings of your station. And he went to various uh, FM stations around the country and pitched this format called the Superstars of rock and roll format, which basically translated to, if you want to get young white males to listen to your station, drop all the black artists and only play Led Zeppelin, Rush, ACDC, so on and so forth. And that led to the tremendous resegregation after sort of a brief golden era in the 60s, the resegregation of the music business. Um, so you could have a black rock band like Funkadelic, Parliament, everybody know who George Clinton is, right? They made really far out like black rock records, but they could not get played on these same stations that would play Led Zeppelin and ACDC because they just, they were black. So even though they played rock music, they couldn't get played. And of course, Stevie Wonder was dropped from those stations and uh, you know, he couldn't get played on them either. And then gradually there, there arose sort of these, what they began to call urban contemporary stations, which was just code language for black FM stations. Um, and what this does, uh, by many accounts, is it alienates uh, young 
uh, the young white American audience, and specifically young white males, from you know black cultural influences. And there, there's in, in the middle. There's also a lot of political hostility at the time too. Um, it's the, sort of the, the the apex of the Black Power era. There's school busing in Boston, and there are huge uh, you know uh, conflicts between you know. Uh, uh, you know, y young white disenfranchised, you know, poorer neighborhoods and poor black neighborhoods, and so um, this is the environment 1979 that hip hop is born into because disco is on the rise, and there's this di ant death to disco movement going on as well. People hate, you know, they they love it or they hate it, um, and hip hop is sort of born at around this time, and this is uh, the result of all of that. Any way to turn the volume up on this? Can I turn that screen on? So this is a Double header at Comiskey Park it's a different, uh, in Chicago than the normal. Um, in August of 1979. So, a. There we go. New Center 5 staffer Mike Kumo is out there at uh, Comiskey Park, and we have him on the phone right now. Mike? Oh, Jim. Yes, what's the, what's the current situation? They just canceled the second game. They canceled the second game because the... The, uh, the field is unplayable, as determined by the umpires. Okay, so this is the famous, what is now called the Comiskey Park Riot of 1979. It started as a, uh, you know, it was kind of a stunt that a local rock DJ uh, arranged. Uh, basically, you could get into the stadium for 99 cents if you bought a disco record to burn. And they were going to blow them up in the middle of the field in between the games of a doubleheader. But what happened is once they blew the, blew the records up, people got so worked up that basically all these kids rushed the field, they ripped up the sod, and you could see the result. Um, it turned into basically a race riot, kind of a, a, a lynching with, you know, no black folks present, basically. Um, but you know, there were definite racial undertones to it. This was, this was the environment that hip-hop was born into, and in, in some ways the attitudes of many of the people who programmed uh, radio at the time. Um, and after, you know, this moment in the 1980s, MTV, which had started um, in 1981, based its programming on this sort of Lee Abrams-style um, very narrow cast, kind of whites only uh, uh, programming with a little like British pop thrown into boot. Um, and when Michael Jackson's famous Thriller album came out in 1983, Walter Yetnikoff, who was the head of CBS, had to pressure Bob Pittman, uh, who was the head of MTV, to play Thriller, you know, to play Billie Jean, to play Beat It. I um, mean, if you can imagine that, this, re this album that became basically one of the best-selling record albums of all time and an American icon. Um, MTV wouldn't play it at first. But even after Thriller, they just didn't play black artists, R&B artists, and there were hardly any, uh, you know, rap videos at the time. Um, MTV would play about one a year, and it was usually from either Run DMC or the Beastie Boys, and then they would not play any other rap videos for the rest of the year. Um, and just to give you an example of how things hadn't changed, this is from 1984. I'll show you a, a video that did not get played uh, on MTV or, and, and the record that did not get played um, uh, on pop radio at the time. <laughs> Remember this? Anybody know this song?
Okay, so this is an artist, uh, whoops, it's an artist named Sherelle, um, who did a song called I Didn't Mean to Turn You On. Uh, and uh, it, did, it did quite well uh, on the, uh, on black stations, I think, you know, nearing number one or went to number one or number two or something like that. Um, but didn't get played, really, on pop stations. Um, then a white British artist named Robert Palmer remade the song. Okay, I won't subject you to any more of that. Um, so the original version went to, I'm oh, sorry, number eight, R&B. Um, but only to number 79 at pop, even though it was top 10 R&B. Um, Robert Palmer, same stations, went to number two. Okay? So this is 1984. It was the same thing as the 1950s. Um, so what happens in the late 1980s? Hip hop really starts to flower. And why does it flower? Because even though major labels really don't, don't sign hip hop, even though pop stations don't play it, even though black stations are very, very resistant to hip hop, relegating airplay to the evenings on weekends, um, you know, where you had to stay up late to listen to the shows of Mr. Magic on WBLS or Red Alert on Kiss FM. Um, because uh, there are sort of independent institutions that arise to replace all of that stuff, um, independent record companies like Profile and Tommy Boy and Def Jam and, um, and people had boom boxes back then so that was another way to sort of share music and hear music in a public space without radio and word of mouth was huge and record stores were still around so you could walk into a record store and, and hear the stuff. Um, uh, and even after uh, uh, Yom TV Raps debuts, and we can talk a little bit about that with Steve because Steve actually plays a bit of a role in bringing um, uh, hip hop finally to MTV. Yom TV Raps debuts in the summer of 1988. Nobody thinks it's going to do anything at the channel, and it ends up being the highest rated show on MTV, right? So it's the complete now subversion of that original MTV uh, ethos which is, you know, we're, we're a rock channel, we play rock, we really don't play R&B, we really don't play this black stuff, and then by the end of the 1980s, it's turned on its head, and the iconic representation of MTV are now three black VJs, Dr. Dre, Ed Lover, and Fab Five Freddy. Even after this, even after Yo! becomes the number one show on MTV, pop radio and black radio are backing away from hip hop. They'll only play like the super, super hits like um, You Can't Touch This by MC Hammer or Ice Ice Baby. Um, just to show you what the attitude of radio was at the time. This is a radio commercial from 1990, right? We just went from 1984, right? Look at 1990. What if you could build a new Houston radio station that was really different? What if you could take out the rap and heavy metal and the meaningless chatter and you could put in a better mix from artists like Phil Collins, Steve Winwood, and Fleetwood Mac? If you Great. could build a radio station that was really different, you'd have the all-new Mix 96.5. For more music, more variety, and a better mix, try the new Mix 96.5 today. So this is a station in Houston that also had a sister station in Boston that used this same commercial. You can see the sort of veiled uh, racial um, imagery that they used. Uh, it's all code language, but we, we all know what it means. Um, and essentially, this was radio still um, in, in the early 1990s when a lot of this stuff that we all know now, uh, I mean, you know the song Jump Around by House of Pain, right? and uh, Baby Got Back, we just talked about, right? These were, <laughs> these were records that, by and large, weren't played on, on pop radio. Um, so what happened? Um, early 1990s, radio remains resistant to hip hop, and then things start to change. In the book, you can read about a little radio station that could, called K-Day in Los Angeles. AM station, low power, weak signal, uh, and because of that, they allow their music director, Greg Mack, to play anything he wants, as long as he beats the cross-town AM station, KGFJ. 
and he ends up playing, doing this, uh, doing something that nobody else in the country knows, and play hip hop in the daytime. Like, just play rap, 60% rap on his playlist. Um, and it becomes an institution in LA, even though the station can't sell advertising around it. So it's not a great business, and they keep threatening to sell the station. Yo! Mm -hmm. TV Raps happens in 1988, and around the same time, there's an FM station, not a black station, but a pop station in San Francisco. Anybody here familiar with the Bay Area? Yeah. 106 KMEL, they call themselves the People Station. And what they did was they, they played rap during the daytime. Not as aggressively as K-Day, but I mean, they played Public Enemy in broad daylight, NWA in broad daylight, um, Af Afrocentric, uh, you know, political hip hop alongside Janet Jackson and Paula Abdul. Um, and that was a very gutsy move for an FM station. So much so that people in the radio industry tried to get KMEL decertified as a pop station and recategorized as a black station. That's how big the resistance was to the shift. Um, and around 1992, um, there's a, a struggling, a lot of these sort of pop stations are sort of dance leaning. They play like Latin freestyle. People know what Latin freestyle is? Like Cover Girls, Expose, Sweet Sensation. So this 1980s Latin tinged dance music. Um, and there was this company called Emmis that owned a station in New York called Hot 97 and a station in Los Angeles called Power 106. And they both played Latin freestyle. And around 1992, the ratings start to tank. And so this guy named Rick Cummings, and you, again, you can read about it in the book, this guy uh, in Indiana, um, used to be David Letterman's program director when David Letterman was on radio. He comes out to Los Angeles to find out what's going on, so he calls this focus group, right? A focus group is, um, you know, basically for uh, executives in the entertainment business who aren't in touch with anything on the ground level. So they call a focus group, a bunch of people into a room and ask them, you know, what's going on? What do you think of this? And what do you think of that? And they ask these young Latinas who are their core audience of Power 106, what do you think of, um, you know, what do you think of, uh, of our, our music? Uh, and they said, oh, you play that whiny girl music. And well, what, do you, what do you listen to? And uh, the girls say, well, hip hop. And the consultant for the station, a guy named Don Kelly, turns to, uh, turns to Rick Cummings, the program director, says, what's hip hop? And the consultant is the guy who's paid to know about this stuff. So they completely missed what was going on in the streets. And this is the era of Cypress Hill and Tribe Called Quest and Queen Latifah and Public Enemy and Ghetto Boys and all this stuff is going on and they just don't know anything about it. But Rick Cummings hears um, Power 106 KML um, in San Francisco. So he knows that it can work. Around this time, K-Day goes off the air in Los Angeles. And so the time is ripe for Power 106 to step into the space. And that's what Rick Cummings does. He does something that nobody in the history of pop radio had ever done, which is to actually embrace hip hop. Not even a, a, a black owned or black oriented radio station had ever done this, to actually brand themselves as hip hop. Um, and what he did was he, he filled his playlist with you know, alongside the Janet Jacksons and the Paula Abduls and the R. Kellys, he also played um, a, 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 a great array of, of hip hop, including a new album that had just come out uh, called The Chronic by a guy named Dr. Dre. So Power 106's hip hop format was born at the same time that The Chronic was born, right? And um, they, uh, they decide to brand the station hip hop, and the slogan they come up with is where hip hop lives, Power 106, where hip hop lives. So just to show you the difference, you saw that old, that 1990 radio commercial? Well, this was Power 106 just three years later, and this is, again, this is gonna look kinda old school to you guys, but picture yourself back in 1990 where you're sort of, everything's sort of whitewashed, and then you see this commercial come on the air.
So this was like in their transition period, you know, out of sort of the Latin freestyle and dance stuff into hip hop. But for a pop station, you would never see a mix of um, white and brown and black people uh, in a commercial. Uh, and this was one of the first pop stations to ever do it. And they were rewarded for having done this by becoming the number one music station in Los Angeles. Um, and they were so successful that they exported the format to a station in New York, Hot 97. And Hot 97, one year later, became the place where hip hop lives. And I think some of you who've grown up here are familiar with you know, the mid-1990s history of um, Hot 97, Funkmaster Flex, Dr. Dre and Ed Lover. Um, it was a place where the hip hop DJs who played in the Bronx on the street corners could actually come and have a radio show. Um, quite amazing. And Hot 97's birth was accompanied, at, it just happened to happen at the same time that a record company called Bad Boy was being founded by Sean Combs. So the birth of, the opening of the doors at pop radio coincided with the birth of these two companies that were in some ways a little d a different message than sort of the political and Afrocentric stuff that had come before it. And so when people want to know why, why did hip hop change and when did it change, it changed because of this coincidence. Literally, the doors opened, not when Public Enemy and Tribe Called Quest were making their best records, but when these huge records by Big and Dre were coming out. And thus, the rise of Power 106 and Hot 97 came at the same time as the rise of Bad Boy and Death Row. Um, so what, I'm wrapping it up here. So what, what, what did this mean for America? So let's go back to 1979, right? December 8th, 1979, a few months after the Comiskey Park riot, on the Billboard Hot 100, measuring the top pop hits in the country, um, only two out of the top 10 artists were black. Um, that was uh, the Commodores and Stevie Wonder. Um, not exactly the most edgy artists at the time. Um, but after hip hop, after Yo! MTV Raps, after the Emma stations flipped to a hip hop format, after um, Def Jam grew from this company that was founded in a dorm to being sold to a polygram for $135 million and valued at $325 million. Um, this is what happened in 2003 for the first time, October 6, 2003. Every single one of the artists in the American top 10 were black artists. So when I say that hip hop desegregated the music business, this is what I mean. Um, it's something that I never saw growing up. It's something that I never felt growing up and, um, you know, Kids today grow up in a very, very different space. Again, not a perfect space. We are not in a post-racial society by any means necessary, by any means, but uh, you know, I think that one of the, the things that hip hop was so powerful at doing is really disproving that, that thought form that we are so unlike each other in this country that, say, white listeners need black art translated for them by white artists. That's why Vanilla Ice never had a second hit. You know, Vanilla, Vanilla Ice had Ice Ice Baby and then gone. Um, that's why uh, even though the Beastie Boys sold very well on their first album, um, they never eclipsed uh, other great rap artists of the day. Um, and that's why Eminem hasn't even eclipsed Jay-Z in terms of, of prominence. Um, it's that it's more of a level playing field now, artistically and business-wise. And a lot of that story is um, a story that I tell in the book. So that's, uh, that's how hip-hop uh, desegregated the American music business. Fascinating. It was great. It was really great. I appreciate you taking the time, putting that together, and sharing that with us. Um, I, d I had a question. I mean, you portray radio as the prime proponent, uh, a carrier of, of hip hop music. Um, would this have happened had not Emmis or any of the other radio broadcasters provided that form? I mean, it's, it's hard to say. I, I think that 
all I knew, being a young executive back then in 1992, um, I, one of the things I talk about in the book is this convention that happens in San Francisco at just the right time, right? It's 1992, and the convention is happening in San Francisco, not in New York, the Gavin Convention. And so all the radio programmers from the country have to come in, and what do they have to listen to? The top pop station in San Francisco is KMEL, and they're playing rap in broad daylight. And because KMEL's in San Francisco, all of the record labels send their rap artists to San Francisco, and I can't tell you the looks on the faces of these redneck radio programmers who walked into the Westin St. Francis Hotel in Union Square and just saw all these rappers and kids of all, you know, colors and ethnicities just swarming the lobby. It's like you could see the discomfort, and the discomfort was evident on the panels, too. The discussions between, say, Rick Dees, uh, who was an air personality on KISS FM in Los Angeles, very Lily White you know, station, and Keith Naftali, who was the program director at, at KMEL. Um, so the time was sort of ripe for something, and it just took a smart person to connect the dots. And I think Rick Cummings was smart, but he also worked for Jeff Smullyan, who, was, who encouraged a bit of freedom of thought and freedom of action at Emmis. But even so, it took Emmis nearly three years to actually complete the cycle and start this format um, and then spread to other stations around the country. And it, and it took a guy from Indiana to figure that out. A guy from Indiana. Okay, uh, Professor Quick. Yeah, in my research about the British invasion and the Beatles, I came across a couple of people who wanted to speak to me, uh, not necessarily on record, but they wanted to tell me that they'd, over, that they'd come um, and found some evidence that in the early 60s, particularly British artists were, were breaking the America, that Motown artists were deliberately being uh, suppressed or being ignored on uh, radio stations in America. Uh, did you find, did you hear anything about that? And secondly, what does that say about how uh, uh, that music has been suppressed over the years. I mean, who's, who are the gatekeepers who have done that? Well, I think the gatekeepers are the people who we talked about. I mean, I have no doubt that, I mean, the music business was so off, I mean, it was not corporate, <laughs> let's put it that way, back in the early 60s. So, you know, uh, legs were getting broken and, and uh, you know, mortgages were getting paid, anything to to create the outcomes that certain people wanted. So I have no doubt that um, black artists and artists of less means, record companies of less means, were pushed out of the way. I mean, the first record company to sign the Beatles was VJ Records, a black-owned record label. They took a chance on this white R&B band from Liverpool. Um, and they weren't able to enjoy the fruits of that because capital snapped them up. And of course, why wouldn't the Beatles want to be on a huge label, you know, their sister label in, in America? I didn't specifically research that time, but um, I think by the 1980s and 1990s, the system had been pretty well set in sort of the majors and pop artists, you know, AKA white artists' favor, that it was just very, very hard for black artists to get they could go to they could go top ten on the R&B charts, and it wouldn't matter to uh, white radio programmers. And they had no problem saying out of their mouths, "Well, that record's too black for my station." I mean, imagine, right? Like saying that in any other profession, you'd be jailed for that. Um, but in the music business, these were respected professionals. Um, this guy right over here was one of the first people in television to to spin. Uh, rap videos. Um, so there's some intelligence over here. You know, I want to I address the, um, the segregation in the record companies. When I was uh, right out of college, I was fortunate enough to get a job working at Atlantic Records as the local New York promotion person. And I quickly learned that I had a counterpart. It was an elderly gentleman named CB. And CB's job was to work the black radio stations, and I was to work the white radio stations. The problem was there was a radio station in New York back then programmed by a very sharp, astute uh, programmer who unfortunately is not with us anymore named Frankie Crocker. And he believed in mixing it up. He didn't see things with color. He saw just great music. And it was not uncommon for him to play the Rolling Stones or anything else. And here's like the number one black radio station in North America, and he's programming. So his music director, Wanda, used to call me up and say, I need you to bring over 
a copy of the New Stones record. I need a copy. That what's that band from Boston? Uh, uh, Jay Giles band. And um, is there anything else you have? Uh, oh, Hall of Notes you have? And like so, I had to like, <laughs> I had to use an intermediary to set up a lunch so I wasn't a offending my cohort. And he knew because I confided in him. He said, "Hey, do what you want." But if his boss. Henry Allen, who was head of black music, as opposed to my boss, who was head of pop music, ever found out that I was going to meet with a black music programmer, it was heresy. And I was also screwing up the priorities because, you know, they had a new Spinner's record and a new Aretha Franklin record coming and uh, Black Heat and uh, Slave. And, and here I am walking in with a new Giles record and she's, she's banging, must have got lost, you know, from a Jay Giles record on a black radio station and they're going, why aren't they playing our black priorities? And it didn't hit me until you said in, in the car out here, the segregation. It was like I was not supposed to talk to the black radio programmers. That was his job. And it was like no different. He was, it was, it was, reverse, it was reverse discrimination. Well, you know, the, 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 the interesting thing about that is that's also what kept this system going yeah. for so long is that black executives had bought into it. Now, I'm not faulting black executives. It was hard to be a black executive in the 1970s. I mean, this was the birth of the phenomenon of the black executive. Where we're just, you know, again, 10 years off of the Civil Rights Act. So just because the United States passes a law in 1965 doesn't mean everything's all hunky-dory. It took uh, years, decades, for this stuff to work itself out. So yeah, for folks who worked at, you know, CBS Records, um, the, you know, uh, to use a, a you know, sort of a slavery analogy, Massa has created this, this area for them. And, you know, this is, their, this is their sort of area of the plantation. And they defended it, I mean, because it was their area. And um, people like Russell Simmons in the, in the early 1980s who started challenging this system, that is what created this great generational um, battle between sort of older black executives who were very much invested in this system and younger black uh, entrepreneurs like Russell Simmons who didn't want to be constrained, who thought that hip hop was, it was black music, but it's teen music, it's for everyone. It's like, you know, you're Italian and you have a pizzeria and you make great pizza but you're only gonna sell it to Italians. You sell it to everybody. That's what Russell Simmons wanted to do. So what we've learned is that radio provided a forum to take this music to the next level. So, okay, so I don't want it to sound like hip hop would not exist today if it wasn't for radio, because we know, from my knowledge, is hip hop is one of the only true indigenous art forms that came out of America. Although, so I wanted to talk, ask you to talk about pre-radio and some of the early pioneers of, you know, rap, toasting, however you want to, talk about it because I think, you know, we all are aware of how radio did it, but who are some of the pioneers and guys that maybe we're all not familiar with right. that started this genre of music? Well, the important thing to know is that it wasn't music. It was stuff that you did at parties. Like, it wasn't like these guys got together and I play guitar and you play the drums and we're going to write a song. That's not how this stuff started at all. It started because bands and live music had sort of evaporated, had become passe, and nightclubs around the city were starting to play records instead of having live entertainment. So the disc jockey moved from the radio into the nightclubs. And downtown, um, you know, this became a real culture. Uh, and the songs, in order to sort of feed the beat on the dance floor, they got longer and longer. And that's what eventually became disco because it was played in these venues called discotheques, right? French word. Um, uptown uh, in Harlem, things were a little more stylized. Like you had, you know, black DJs had always, um, on the radio, had always mastered this sort of on-air patter, like they would sort of like rhyme between songs just to kind of keep, you know, keep things moving along. Frankie Crocker was one of those, you know, great folks known for rhyming. And there's this kid named DJ Hollywood who lived, Anthony Holloway, who, who you know, was 13, 14 years old and imitated Frankie Crocker. And when he finally started DJing in clubs, he tried to be like Frankie Crocker and rhymed, uh, you know, over the intros of records, in between records, to kind of keep the beat going. But then, 
as some of these mixing techniques started, like people started figuring out how to get one record and blend it seamlessly into the next one so the beat never stopped. So if there's no intro to a record, where do you rhyme? Well, you find an instrumental section of that record to rhyme over. And that really was the beginning of rap, in a way, in the way we think of rap. Across the Harlem River, in the Bronx, these kids can't get into the discos, right? Um, they're either too young, they don't have the clothes to get in, you have to be kind of, you know, you have to have some money to get into a club. So they took their parties to the parks and the playgrounds. And the first guy to really do it in the Bronx was a guy named Cool Herc. And Clive Campbell was his real name. And he decided to throw this party uh, in August of 1973, a legendary party. And the reason it's legendary is that Herc decided that he wasn't going to play like the glitzy disco stuff. He liked to play like the funk records like James Brown and Rare Earth that kids in the Bronx like to dance to. We kind of a little rougher crowd. Like they just like, like the hard stuff. Um, but the guys who danced waited for like the, the breakdown part of the song to come up so they can let their dance moves really go. Um, and the breakdown part is usually when the instruments cut out and it's just the beat or just the bass and drums. And so Herc found a way to take two copies of the same record and extend that beat from the left to the right to the left to the right, crossfading between the two turntables to keep that beat going. Um, and the break, the breakdown section became referred to as the break. And the kids who danced to those break sections became break dancers. So that's the beginning of DJing, and then the people who rhymed over them, MCing, break dancing, and then you know the other element to that was graffiti because graffiti was all around um, at the time and a part of like making the flyers that promoted these parties. So Herc invented that merry-go-round technique. A kid named Flash, who became Grandmaster Flash, perfected it by making it seamless, and he was like when you think of like the great rock guitarist. He was like the first of that ilk in hip hop. He was the first to really turn it into a technique. And then finally, a guy named Africa Bombada from the other side of the Bronx, he, his contribution as a DJ was to expand the vocabulary, the musical vocabulary. So he didn't just play those funk records, right? He could find a cool beat in almost any record, like the first few bars of Sgt. Pepper's from the Beatles and the first few bars of Honky Tonk Woman by the Rolling Stones, and uh, a couple of instrumental bars from a record by the Monkees. Uh, and it's, it's no mistake that the more sort of when we think of like that, um, the native tongue golden age rappers like De La Soul, Tribe Called Quest, they were the grandbabies of Africa Bambata. They were all sort of musically related to Africa Bambata. Um, they came out of that crew or were affiliated with that crew. So that was how hip hop evolved in the Bronx. And then you had this sort of upscale ho DJ Hollywood, Eddie Chiba, Lovebug, Starsky, you know, strain. So you had this upscale rap and you had this downscale hip hop and it kind of all came together. But you can still see the strains in the music as the music went forward. You had upscale and downscale upwardly mobile and keep it real. You had Puffy on one hand and you had the Wu-Tang Clan on the other. You can still see the strains of that Harlem versus the Bronx thing in hip hop today. So commercially viable, what was the first commercially viable you know, rap record? Well again, because it was stuff that people did at parties, it was just you know, people started to tape the parties because unique things would happen at these parties that could never be duplicated. Rhymed routines that, that uh, you know, Flash and his, you know, his Furious Five MCs put together. Um, people would fiend for these tapes. They would pay good money, like $5, $10 to get a copy of this cassette tape so they could play it on their boom box. But the first person to actually think to, that maybe I could put this stuff on a record and sell it it's like you going to a party and goofing around with your friends and then somebody saying, oh, I want to I tape it and sell it. I mean, it's a crazy idea. Nobody really believed, well, I mean, this isn't music. We're not writing any songs. We're not even singing. But a woman named Sylvia Robinson had an idea to put this stuff on a record. So who was Sylvia? 
Sylvia started as a performer herself at 13 years old. She was little Sylvia, recording R&B records for this label in Newark. Um, then she teamed up with her guitar teacher, Mickey Baker, and she became Mickey and Sylvia. And they had this record called Love is Strange, and if you've ever seen the movie Dirty Dancing or seen the movie Casino, this is a classic American hit, um, and everybody knows Sylvia's voice. Um, after that, when she realized that, you know, she wasn't going to spend the rest of her life being a performer, she decided to start producing records. She produced the first hit for Ike and Tina Turner. Um, and she may very well have been the very first female record producer of pop music in America, period. Um, she's a black woman. Like, that's great. And nobody ever talks about her like that. Um, but I think that she was. She might have been. I haven't seen an ex example of anybody else who did it before her. Well, Florence Greenberg? For, what did she do? Scepter Records. What year? No, no. When the, the, all those early B.J. Thomas and, and Dionne Warwick records. I'm not sure. Those, those were... We should, we should figure that out. Yeah, that's homework. Okay. Um, so she starts producing. She, she, she founds her own record label, Platinum Records, with her husband Joe Robinson. Uh, and um, they change the name from Platinum to All Platinum because they find out that distributors pay their vendors in alphabetical order. So they went from P to A. Um, and she produces some, some records that you know very well. Um, uh, you ever heard of a song called Love on a Two-Way Street? Moments. Moments? Well, if you've heard a song called Empire State of Mind by Jay-Z and Alicia Keys, samples that record. Um, the piano that you hear throughout, that's Sylvia. That's Sylvia wrote that. Um, and she had a couple of other big hits in the 1970s, then her company almost went bankrupt. So by the time she hears this rap stuff, she's a down-on-her-luck former artist, former record producer, facing bankruptcy. She goes to this religious revival in the mountains of New Jersey, not far from here, has this epiphany that God's going to save her and save her business. That very night, she goes to the Harlem World Nightclub in Harlem, sees Lovebug Starsky going a hip, a hop, a hibbit, a hip, a hop, a hop, hibbit, dibbit, hibbit, dibbit, hop. And she's like, this is it. This is what God sent, you know, sent me here for. Um, God told me to make this record. And so she tries to get Lovebug Starsky to make the record. Love, make a record? What do you mean? You know? So she gets three guys from New Jersey to do it. And that's the Sugar Hill Gang. And the song that she made was called Rapper's Delight. And usually at the birth of a genre, it starts very small. Like the earliest punk records, nobody bought them. You know, there were these little 45 RPM records. You can barely even find them anymore. Rapper's Delight which replayed the biggest hit of the summer of 1979, which was Sheik's Good Times, became in its time the largest, the most, the largest selling 12-inch single of all time, selling upwards of seven, eight million records. Nobody knows for sure, because Joe Robinson would never let the RIA look at his books. But was that the first 12-inch, too? I mean, that was weird, too. I remember it was a 12 inch, it was one song on a, on a 12 inch? Right, 15 minutes long. And she wouldn't cut it because she said God told her to keep it 15 minutes long. Um, and so they formed this record company called Sugar Hill. Uh, and one of the things I do in the book is um, I try to tell you what that means. So Sugar Hill is actually the name of a, a neighborhood in Harlem, um, in Manhattan. I, if you, know, you know where Columbia University is in Manhattan? That's sort of that high ridge. Right? Um, well, Sugar Hill, um, that land in, the, in the, you know, the dawn of America was owned by a guy named Alexander Hamilton, who basically invented American business. And when Hamilton died, um, uh, it was parceled out and called Hamilton Heights. And that's where like the rich folks could live. So Duke Ellington lived up there. The song Take the A Train was written by Bobby Mercer because that's how he would have to go up to, you know, you must take the A train if you want to get to Sugar Hill way up in Harlem. Sugar Hill, they called it Sugar Hill because it was where black folks could live the sweet life. And so when she called her New Jersey label, because she was in Englewood, Sugar Hill, she had never even lived in Sugar Hill as a, as a child. She lived down in the flatlands in Harlem. Sugar Hill was like, we're going to make it, you know, uh, it was sort of the same thing that Alexander Hamilton has as a 16-year-old kid coming to this country as an orphan 
and then en ending up basically winning the Revolutionary War for us with George Washington. Um, and so hip hop has always been about that aspiration, even from its inception, and that's what Sugar Hill really represents, both in a historic and a, and a musical sense. Okay, I wanted to get to some questions that some of our uh, students here submitted, so we go to... Uh, <clears throat> uh, Joseph asked this question. So, uh, when Yo! MTV Raps premiered in 1988, it obtained one of MTV's highest ratings. This showed both the power of music to challenge the perceived cultural norm, as well as the power of artists to bring about this change. Now, it's 20 years later, and Jersey Shore is MTV's uh, highest rated show, <laughs> and music has been trivialized. What does this sad shift say about our culture? And how can artists of today rise above the noise to once again bring about social change. Wow. We were just talking about this. Um, that's a, wow, that's great. Um, I was just saying that if you were a kid in the 1960s and you felt like you had something to say artistically and you also wanted that, what you were saying to mean something and to have resonance and have a huge audience, and to change the world, you would probably be going into music because it was the musicians who were changing the world, whether it was the Beatles or uh, you know, James Brown or Aretha Franklin or Jimi Hendrix. Music led the way culturally. Um, in the 1970s, film actually took a little bit of that energy too. Um, some of the great movies that America has produced came out of the 1970s, whether The Godfather, Bonnie and Clyde, you know, so this new generation of American filmmakers are making these edgy, gritty, Scorsese came out of that era. But even in the 1980s and 1990s, music was still the fundamental way that if you wanted to create social change as an artist, it was one of the best and most impactful ways to do it. And I point to Public Enemy in the late 1980s as an example. Um, even Tupac in the 1990s had a huge impact, not only on American artists, but all across the world. But, you know, music's value has decreased, as you know. I mean, literally, its value. Uh, it, it's not worth hard anything anymore because people can just get it for free. It's not that music means less to us, it's just that it's worth less in a monetary sense and that does have impact on what do people really want to put their energy into this. I sort of have this feeling like if you really want to make an impact on the world, now you're a kid and you, you have energy and you're probably going to make apps. You know, I remember seeing the end of the social network, that movie on Facebook and the end is this long, slow pull into Zuckerberg's face. Uh, and uh, I think the song they're playing is Baby, You're a Rich Man by the Beatles. And thinking how much the Beatles meant in the 1960s and how little their music is worth to the consumer now versus what this kid invented in 2004 and what that's worth and what they're making the movies about now. So how do you put worth back into it? Um, if I knew the answer to that question, I'd probably still be in the music business. Um, instead, I decided that writing this book was probably a better way for me to make my contribution. But it's not to say that music doesn't count. It really does. And I'm telling you something. All it takes is for one artist who has influence to change the debate a little bit. I mean, if Lil Wayne had some epiphany overnight and decided to clean up his act and get really political and Hot 97 would play them. <laughs> I don't think they're anti-political. I just think they want what's easy and what's hot. Um, so that, I, that's, that's, that's what I have. I, but I also wouldn't want to end this question without talking a little bit about your contribution to the sort of movement of rap on to young people. I know that Steve, one of the things I read about my book is that Steve really tried, actually before Yo! MTV Raps was born, um, Steve worked at U68, right? Which was a UHF um, broadcast TV channel that had uh, a, one of the only specialty rap shows, like one of two in the country maybe, called Fresh Rap. Wow. 
Good memory. And when you went to, uh, you were hired away by MTV, and you, well, you should probably tell this story. The idea um, was there was a UHF station in Newark, New Jersey that um, was showing movies because there was not cable in the outer boroughs. Brooklyn, Queens, Bronx, Staten Island did not have access to cable. So if you want to watch movies, and you were familiar with HBO, you subscribe to Wilmette Go Home Television, you got a box, and it was scrambled, descramble a signal, you can watch movies. And then what's unique about this station, it had two adjacent television signals. Channel 67 in Smithtown, Long Island, covered all of Long Island and parts of Manhattan. Channel 68 on top of the Empire State Building covered most all of Manhattan and parts of New Jersey. So they decided they wanted to uh, compete in the music video arena because, again, MTV had done a good job of selling the concept of music videos, but there was no access for people who didn't have cable. So they asked me to help put this channel together, and we were, you know, when they didn't have their God Squad uh, paid programming on, we would play music videos. And, you know, so I had wrestling shows on the weekend. I had a country music countdown show. I had a heavy metal show. Uh, late at night, and I wanted to do something with rap. A, a friend of mine had just uh, produced a video for Run DMC. Um, no, was who, or was, who was, was it? Was Steve Kahn? He did. Um, oh wait, he did, and he did a. Houd I think he did a Houdini video too. So it was like a Houdini video and a Run DMC video. But you did Rockbox. Rockbox. That was the first video. That was it. That's the one. Rockbox. You're right. And so I think we did on Saturday mornings, like from 10 to noon. And we had one guy selling advertising, and when we started playing whatever few rap videos there were, we actually got some advertisers immediately jumped on it. So, oh, this is, this is good. So um, I had to go running around trying to find rap videos. Um, and it was not easy, but there was stuff out there. Eventually, I actually got, uh, actually got the Sugar Hill Gang video, which is kind of not a really a video. It was more of a performance piece. But anyway, found enough videos. So, after the station got sold to the Home Shopping Network, I was fortunate enough to get hired by MTV to be in charge of their um, VJ Air Stiff. Anyway, long story short, the guy that was the head of v programming, a guy named Lee Masters, um, used to sit around and came up with the idea one day club MTV and, and uh, uh, Headbangers Ball. And I said, you know, you really should play some rap videos. And he goes, well, it's not enough. I said, sure there is. He says, I don't think so. I said, well, I'm going to get you a tape. I'll show you. So I had a, an air check back then. It was a VHS. I brought it to him. Showed him. Yeah, you're probably right. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe we'll try it as an experiment. We'll do it once on the weekend and see what happens. So a um, young guy there, Ted Demi, who's no longer with us, um, and a couple of his friends, and uh, Fab Five Freddy, and and drain it. Love it. So they, they did this thing, Yo! MTV Raps, and it was like a special one-off, one weekend. I think it was a couple of hours. And of course, the overnight ratings come back on Monday morning, and they're freaking out how great it is, and they're thinking, okay, so we should do this. So what they did was they kept using it to, to jerk around the ratings, a specialty thing, and eventually they realized, hey, we should strip this um, across the board. And of course, if you build it, they will come is what happened. And of course, all the um, hip-hop artists, rap artists, were able to then convince the you know, they're the labels that you should make a budget and set aside some money um, to make videos because look at this, this channel, MTV, they're going to actually play this stuff. And um, so, you know, um, as, as, as Dan outlines it in the book, that's kind of how it happened. And when I, when I was doing it, um, the only other thing was uh, Video Box, I think it was? Video Music Box. Video Music Box. Ralph McDaniels had been doing this way before me, and he got totally freaked out. He, he was on like a little small tiny... Uh, public television station in New York. I think he bought the time or something. And here's this big UHF station, you know, blasting out. And he was like, he came out to see me and was like, yo, man, we should do something together. And it's like my general manager at the time was like, we don't need any, you know, we don't need any a third party here. We're just showing, you know, videos. And so I had to reluctantly tell Ralph, hey, thanks. I appreciate it. You know, we're, we're brothers and comrades here, but um, this, is, this is all I can do. And you should keep doing what you're doing. And, you know, you're, you're, you've got your audience and we got ours and someday we'll meet somewhere. So um, he was doing it before us, but um, it was great because if, it was the concept. If you build it, they will come. And that's kind of how the music videos got on 
um, MTV and eventually I shook the tree and got BET, woke up <laughs> years later or much time later. But then the same thing happened in radio too. I mean, it was the black stations that eventually followed the pop stations into hip hop. Um, kind of amazing, but that's how it happened. You know, you know any, any art form seems to come out of frustration or desperation. You know, here's a UHF station that can't make any money and they want to try to put it on the map, so let's play some, something weird. And MTV's like trying to figure out how to get their ratings, let's play something different. Um, and then I, I noticed, I think you talked about this, is take this into other businesses, but so hip hop helped launch soda brands, yes. right? Yes. So you hear had you this, you know, Seven Up. Everybody knows Seven Up, but there's this other like Johnny Come Lately soda called Sprite. So we're desperate. We got to get more market share for Sprite. Let's align ourselves with this this alternative weird music that not everybody understands. Yep. Um, that's a story that I tell in the book about a young marketing executive, young black marketing executive named Daryl Cobbin graduated uh, from, um, I think, Clark University in Atlanta. And uh, he, a lot, a lot of Atlanta grads, they go right into Coke, because Coke's based in Atlanta. And that's if you're in the marketing, that's you know, a great place, because Coke invented American marketing, basically, invented advertising. And um, he decides to go work for Sprite, because they're one of the more edgy brands in terms of advertising. You know, they've actually done, they did something with Curtis Blow, like one of the first rap rappers back in the 80s and um, but you know the big boy in in the coca-cola company is coke the, you know what was coke classic then and sprite was not in the same vein as a cola colas were the big boys and then you had lemon lime like the lemon lime segment and you sort of see the parallel to pop you know mainstream and black right so but lemon limes were sold to moms and kids. That's who lemon lime sodas appeal to. That's who they were marketing them to. So that's why, you know, I like the Sprite in you. That was their slogan back in the day. Um, awful. Uh, and he noticed using Coke's advanced computer system that uh, Sprite was selling very well in um, minority, ethnic minority areas, black and Latino. And he felt that if he could do a campaign that harnessed the power of hip hop, that he could advance the brand in that market um, and actually compete for market share with colas. And this was heresy in the Coca-Cola. You, know, you stay in your lane, sell more to moms and kids and beat 7-Up. That's all you gotta do, just beat 7-Up. And he said, no, I wanna compete with the colas. Um, and they're like, yeah, yeah, right, whatever, you know. So they allow him to do this campaign called Obey Your Thirst. Uh, and he actually gets like real rappers rhyming over real beats in real time in a real recording studio and just shoots it and puts it on the air. And kids flip out. I mean, I remember when these commercials came out, like you couldn't believe that a corporation was doing something like this. I actually have a video of, you know, of, uh, how corporations used to treat rap in commercials, like one of the first McDonald's commercials that used rap. Zelda, back in the, when the first Zelda came out, right. 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 So um, then here's this Sprite commercial that's just amazing and smart and funny, and people would like lean towards their VCRs, video cassette recorders, for those of you who don't remember, um, to tape this stuff when it came on the air. And uh, Sprite, for the next two years, became the fastest growing soft drink in America. Um, it doubled its market share, uh, vastly outpacing 7-Up, uh, and took the, NW, N, uh, took the NBA sponsorship away from its sister brand, Coke. Uh, and yeah, Sprite Fest? Wasn't there, Sp wasn't there a concert, Sprite Fest or something? I don't know, there might have been. I don't, I don't know. but, but uh, uh, um, they did tons of commercials after that that were just as edgy and um, it just showed it was sort of the proving ground for hip hop as a something that corporations could use not in a way that was patronizing or condescending but if you actually met 
the culture at its own level, if you didn't talk down to the audience but actually um, appreciated what this thing was, that it would help your brand. Um, and that was a big change, I think, that hip hop wrought in corporate America. And then, and then bringing it around today, so vitamin water and fitty. Right. right. Um, one of the big things that hip hop did was uh, it began to, it w because it had existed sort of as independent institutions long before major labels and radio stations and MTV started embracing it. Um, a lot of young black entrepreneurs began to see that they had power and that they had leverage um, and that why would, if I'm selling uh, my records and cassettes and CDs for eight dollars a pop out of the trunk of my car, why am I going to let some record company sign me and only give me three dollars a record? That's not going to happen with me. You're going to give me a better deal. So it starts with the Wu-Tang Clan, it starts, uh, it continues with um, E-40 in the Bay Area and Master P and, um, and uh, God, who am I, uh, and Cash Money Records, which gave you Lil Wayne. Um, and then finally, you have folks like Damon Dash, who's, you know, has his own company, Rockefeller, that he shares with his rapper Jay-Z. And they go to Iceberg Jeans to get an endorsement deal. You know, maybe Jay is starting to sell some records. Maybe we can do business together. Like, well, Jay's not the kind of artist that we want to be involved with. And Dame says, okay, fine. I'm going to start my own clothing company. I'm going to put you out of business. And that's what he did. I and mean, Wu-Tang had Wu Wear, which did very well. It was the first urban clothing brand to break into Macy's. Um, and then he, f he founds Rockaware. Uh, and Rockaware shoots to the top. Sean Combs found Sean John. And suddenly you have Nautica and Ralph Lauren and Calvin Klein running to catch up to these brands. Um, so it, you actually have the replacement of these sort of mainstream American brands in the eyes of young people with relevant upscale urban brands. Um, and the ultimate upshot of that is when 50 Cent makes all his money, he starts a clothing brand and he starts a, um, a, sh a shoe line with Reebok, but now he has money. He doesn't need an endorsement deal. Um, he's actually going to invest that money. So he finds a small beverage company in Queens called Energy Brands that operates under the name of Glisseau. And they have this drink called Vitamin Water. And so he buys into the company. He gets about 10% of the value of the company. And, um, and then a few years later, they sell to Coca-Cola for $4.1 billion. And 50 Cent doesn't get 10% of that. He gets 10% of the share that was left over after they paid out other partners. But it was probably the largest single payoff to an individual as a result of hip hop ever. So hip hop came a long way from the first $15 that DJ Hollywood made to DJ party. This is like also just something super interesting. Like what was it like six months ago, where he bought like a, a ridiculous amount of money in this really small headphone company and tweeted about it for one weekend and made something like eight million dollars over the weekend via Twitter. Possibly violating SEC regulations Probably, too. Yeah, and really all he did was tweet. He was like, he was like, if I was going to invest money, I would invest it here, and he made a, like a ridiculous like millions and millions. Yeah. Over the weekend. I don't actually know what the upshot of that is. I don't know if he's being investigated for that, but that's actually, I mean, that's, that's some like, you know, like hood hustle transplanted onto Wall Street, but without the knowledge, like, you know, the, that's actually like, I mean, people do that all the time, but not quite that brash. Um, like Martha Stewart, you know, kind of went to jail over that, so. Right, Richard. right. No, but it's a, a great point. What about, <clears throat> and what about today, Dr. Dre, the Beats, the headphones? Yeah, it's like, you know, <laughs> Detox is supposed to have come out, like his album is supposed to have come out, you know, on 420. And we're, 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 still, we're still waiting for it, but he's already announced, you know, more Beats by Dre ventures and products, and um, that's where the real money is. I mean, as the music industry was built tr traditionally on two financial pillars. On the left, you had the value of the copyright, right? I have the right to copy this music. You don't. You have to pay me for a copy, right? And then the other part was touring, right? 
I'm going to be playing in this room. There's a guy at the door that's going to collect $5 if you have to pay him if you want to get in to hear me play. That's how artists were able to support themselves for the majority of the history of the music business. What happened as the result of the advent of the internet and digital compression is that this pillar just went away because the value of the copyright had just gone. In other words, there's no way to protect the copyright. There was no way to, to, to keep people from having access to music through these compressed digital files. You didn't have to go to a record store, you didn't have to pay anyone, you could just download it, right? Um, and luckily, hip hop had always, because it had been outside of this business anyway, it had always, it had always cultivated this third pillar, which I'll call branding. Most pop acts hadn't been able to really successfully create consumer products and ancillary businesses. Look at Apple, I'm not the computer company, but the record company that was founded by the Beatles was a disaster. I mean, the biggest example of a celebrity product I can think of from the 1970s when, when Teddy Pendergrass did Teddy Jeans. And how long did those last? Like, um, uh, the, the first viable brand I think that a pop act produced that actually had some staying power was Woo Wear. That was a hip hop band. Because people in hip hop have been doing it all along. So hip hop acts sort of have a leg up because they've always been unabashed self-branders. Um, and so I, I think that's why Jay-Z is so big. That's why 50 is big. That's why um, this culture has produced sort of an entrepreneurial class that embraces selling themselves and selling their brand. Let's go back to some questions from the students. Um, Michael asked the question, do you feel artists like Ice-T, Snoop, Tupac uh, changed gangster rap and made it better seller because it became more acceptable than it was prior? Mm. Well, gangster rap just start, I mean, Oh, how can I put this? If you, the first gangster rap record is generally considered to be Schooly D's PSK, which was a, re a record out of Philadelphia in the mid 1980s. It was sort of like a self produced, self manufactured record. Highly influenced the Beastie Boys when they made their first record. Highly influenced Ice T. If you listen to Six in the Morning, which was Ice T's first kind of gangster record. It's a straight bite of PSK. And Boys in the Hood, which was the first record for a guy named Easy e was also based on PSK and Six in the Morning. So, but if you think about what School E.D. was rhyming about, and if you actually take those rhymes and compare it to the rhymes in a book that was written in 1963 by Roger Abrams called Deep Down in the Jungle, a sociological work where Roger Abrams went out to street corners in Philadelphia and actually recorded um, young and old black men doing these sort of street corner routines. This is 1963, well before the first rap record in 1979. You look at those lyrics, the exact same thing, right? All gangster rap did was took this particular strain of the African American oral tradition and put it on wax, right? Braggadocio, violent rhymes, but it's all sort of, it's all hyperbole, but set against the actual political and social realities of the 1980s, gangster rap was all too real. It really did portray um, communities that were under siege from the police on one hand and the gangs on the other. Um, I think a lot of the early gangster rap records were also political, sometimes intentionally, sometimes by default. Nobody can tell me that F the Police isn't a political record. Yeah. Ice-T made political records. Cop Killa was a political record. Tupac made political records. It was only in the mid-1990s that things got really nihilistic and it just became drugs and guns and violence for that, you know, just the entertainment and shock value. Um, I, I don't say that Snoop and Tupac cleaned it up because I think Tupac and Snoop actually degenerated, you know, in terms of their you know, political content and sort of um, redeeming social value. Uh, Tupac lost himself as he became famous. He came from a royal, royal black power family, the Shakurs. Um, uh, he needed to prove himself to no one, but 
seemed to feel that he needed to prove himself to gangsters like Suge Knight and, and, uh, and Haitian Jack and ended up getting killed for it. Um, so it's a very, very sad tale how hip hop sort of lost um, that, that political sense. But I also, I don't want to devalue that hip hop either. Like hip hop can be a lot of different things. It's just lost its balance. You know, you would have these nihilistic, materialistic, violent records, sexist records, but you would also have happy rap, and you'd have comedy rap, and you'd have political rap, and you have Afrocentric rap. We've just lost the balance, right? Um, and this is the man that's been left standing for a number of reasons. Um, and one of the biggest reasons, I feel, is just this is America, and America is materialistic and misogynist and, and violent, and so as things become mainstream, they become more like that. Um, so that's a long-winded answer for a very simple question. Yeah. So uh, Chris here suspects some scandal. The journalist Scott Paulson Bryan is about to release his article on Sean uh, Puffy Combs when it stopped from print because Combs was fired. Did this article ever go to print, to your knowledge? Yes. Um, uh, if you read a little later in that chapter, um, they held the presses just so he could revise the article. Then the article comes out as Puffy's looking for a new record deal. What great publicity. Um, and whenever Puffy would see Scott Polson Bryan out in later in life, even now, he's like, that dude made me. Like, you made my career by writing that one article. That's all it takes. Sometimes that's all it takes is just the right timing. So much of this stuff that people think are like grand conspiracies and uh, you know, why did gangster rap move to the fore and why did this happen and you know, they think there's a bunch of cigar chomping white guys in a back room somewhere, you know, plotting the destruction of culture and it just, the, this, the more nuanced and sad part of that is that what happens in culture and art and polit you know, at least in, in this, in hip hop, didn't even require that. It just required people to be in a room and not care. Um, and I think that is probably more, more the truth. Uh, Dave asked a question, um, how do you think rap and the hip hop industry would have been affected if the issues of racism and prejudice towards lower class citizens never existed? And do you think it would ever, uh, ever even existed then? I mean, I guess not. I mean, it's, it's hard, that's a big what if because American, the central through line of American history is race. That is what America's story is about. America was born in this racial dichotomy and it has to resolve that racial dichotomy in one way or another. Um, America was born with sort of this split personality. On the one hand, it was the, it was the country that developed this sort of conception of slavery and that um, slaves would be counted as three-fifths, you know, for the purposes of vote and that, that carries a lot of spiritual weight. And then you have the Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal. So how do you resolve these two? I mean, and what that, that split resulted in the Civil War. I mean, the Civil War didn't resolve it and that came out in the Civil Rights era in the 1960s. And between Democrats and Republicans now, if you look at the Tea Party versus Obama, you're still seeing that schism, that, that, tent, that central tension in American history trying to resolve itself. Um, I happen to be an optimist. I think it will resolve itself. Um, uh, and the point of writing the book was to show that hip hop did play a bit of a role in turning a generation, um, turning uh, white kids and black kids and Latino kids and Asian kids towards each other. Um, that's, that's my theory anyway. Thank you. Sue posed the question to you. You think it's possible for a college student today, like Rick Rubin, to create and operate something like Def Jam, where you apply a minimum, you know, a drum machine, 300 bucks, and do it out of a dorm room? And if, if no, what would hinder someone from doing that today? today? I just say these are like the best questions of any college class I've been in, and I've been in a few. So I just really like impressed with the depth and the thought. Um, I would say yes, it is possible. It's just a very different world, right? You can do actually have more freedom than Rick Rubin ever had because 
Everything you need is right on your Macintosh right now. Your recording studio, you don't need to buy studio time, you know, a little microphone, you got your, you know, a little keyboard and that's it. You've created, you can create a multi-tracked masterpiece. You can even create a video along with it, with your iPhone. Um, and then post it up and have infinite distribution on a, on a web page. But how do you make money? How do you get broadcasting? Because all these YouTube pages and Facebook pages are, are narrow, you know? They're, you have your followers. How do you increase your number of followers on Facebook, on Twitter? That's really the question, and I don't think that question is resolved either. Everybody's trying to figure that one out. How do you rise above the din in an era of microcasting, not even narrow casting? It's, you know, there used to be one radio station where you could hear all the hits, and now then it became Sirius Satellite Radio, where you could just pick your, you know, from 150 different channels. And now, everybody, you're your own channel. You're your own radio station. Um, how do you get some sort of mass exposure for that? Um, I think the, the answer is you, we have less control than ever. No one knows why things go viral. They only know certain things have more of a propensity to go viral. So if you make a video with a cute little kitten in it, um, probably you know, that'll get you some exposure. Um, but that's why it's, uh, you know, the Chinese, uh, I think the characters for the word crisis uh, are danger and opportunity together. And we're in a crisis right now in the music business. It's danger and it's opportunity. Um, so a complex answer again to a simple question. Philip asked this question, looking at rap now, is there a real resistance to white rap and hip hop? You mentioned a couple artists like MC Lars, even Das Racist. They have a chance to break, you think? I don't know. I mean, it depends on what you call hip hop. I think that there isn't a resistance to folks like Eminem. Um, I think there's a resistance to Asher Roth when he says some dumb shit, you know, like some racially dumb shit. But, um, you know, generally I think there was goodwill to people like Asher Roth, um, you know, as long as they respected, you know, the space. Um, I think the, the Beasties and Eminem have always respected the space and they've been respected. Um, I think a lot of the, some of the folks you mentioned sort of exist for me and again, you know, I've been writing a book for the last four years so in some ways I'm way out of it. But like a lot of them seem to be, they're not really gunning for, for pop hits. They're, they're kind of off to the side doing their own a little more creative, a little more offbeat thing, and so they're never going to be competing for airtime on Hot 97 against Wayne, against Drake, against Nicki Minaj. But I'm, I think, I think there's more space for everyone. I am less concerned, sorry to say, with opportunities for white artists, and more concerned with can we maintain proper opportunities for black artists because it's the black artists that have been sort of on the outs in the music business and in the entertainment business for many years. Only one black man in Hollywood uh, can green light a movie and it's the 21st century. Why is Tyler Perry the only black man in the world who can make a movie when he wants to make a movie? That's not right. You know, something, the power structure has to change. So um, that's sort of where my, my own focus is. Well, sort of continuing in that uh, train, um, Roxanne want to know who you think is the most original upcoming hip-hop artist. Oh, man. Oh, and will auto-tune ever stop? I hope so. I hope so. Um, even Jay-Z couldn't kill auto-tune. He said, death of the auto-tune, and they're still doing it. Um, the most original upcoming, you know, I would hope that it'd be somebody like uh, Odd Future. But I think Odd Future, uh, before Odd Future can become successful, they need to respect the law. And I'm not talking about the legal law, I'm talking about the law of pop music. And everybody from, you know, from NWA, who you would consider very, very edgy, or, uh, to, 
you know, the carpenters has to obey this law. It doesn't matter what you rhyme or sing about. Verse, chorus, verse, <laughs> chorus, bridge, chorus, out. Respect that, you have a chance to be successful. You cannot just discard gravity. And nobody can tell me that, that, I mean, there are a few exceptions to this, I know, Rapper's Delight being one of them, but I don't think there's any way to sustain a career without understanding the, the structure that the human ear and human brain wants to hear. We want to hear a refrain. We want to come back to a center. We want to have gravity. So, yeah, I like Odd Future. I like their energy, but they need to focus. They need to be on a planet <laughs> of some sort. Do you have a question? What about the sex business? Because they kind of remind me of that version of the sex business. Energy-wise, but, but Sex Pistols respected song structure. <laughs> yeah, but just their attitude. Their very attitude. Yeah, but yeah. attitude alone won't do it. Public mm -hmm. Enemy, again, I keep coming back to them because it's my generation, but Chuck D said a lot of smart stuff. And one of the things he said was, you know, what Public Enemy does is reach the bourgeois and rock the boulevard, right? You have to make people think. The greatest pop music makes people think and makes people dance. You can do one or the other, like what, an example of a record that makes people dance and not think would be maybe You Can't Touch This, would maybe be Soldier Boy, right? Uh, a record that makes people think and not dance. Um, you know, pick any uh, sort of lyrical, miracle, lyrical, lyrical backpack rapper, you know, it's just all lyrics and, you know, no chorus. Uh, but the best music, I think, pop music across the board, does both of those jobs. Um, and Kanye is a good example of that for me. I mean, say what you will about Kanye, like, he never forgets to make people dance, but he's always saying some stuff to make you think a little bit. Even just something stupid and clever, but he's doing it. Um, I feel the same way about Drake. I feel the same way about Nicki Minaj. I'm not a hater of, you know, modern hip-hop. It's just not the hip-hop I grew up with, but I respect it for what it is. This, this is a little random, but there's this rapper who I really, really like <coughs> taking a liking to. I think they're so talented and really cool. And it's actually a, a Korean rapper from Los Angeles. And his stuff is just like straight up talent, genius, uh, self promoter and stuff. His name is Dumbfounded. Dumbfounded? Yeah. I love that name. He's I haven't ever, I've never heard him. His stuff is like phenomenal, like just like professionally produced videos and recordings. Like I take notes on his business tactics. How did you find him? I, I, I found him from an artist who I like, did like a collab with him. He's just, he's, he's a YouTube guy, but he's just like genius. Um, and like, I guess like watching these people on YouTube who really like have more talent than a lot of you hear on the radio. And I thought of him because like his lyrics are, are genius and then he has catchy hooks and stuff. Do you think that there's a chance that like other, um, ethnic minorities, like really like you see Asian films are very poorly represented in mainstream music. Do you think that, like isn't it, do you think that like something like Asian culture has a chance to invade the hip hop industry where I guess no one would have really thought about that uh, 10, 15 years ago? <laughs> well, yes and no. Like, you remember Jin? Like yeah. he was going to be like the first Jin, Asian, yeah. Asian rapper. Um, he's good. You know, the Asian Eminem they call him. Right. Um, I don't know. You know, Usually this kind of stuff comes out of communities where there's great social dislocation. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I think it was Filipino Americans that really had the most affinity for hip hop because they were kind of lowest on the socioeconomic uh, chain and it's like, for a while in the 1990s, like all the best hip hop DJs were Filipino. Like just, and why? Why? You know, because they just had, I, and I think a lot of it has to do with sort of the predisposition, because the Philippines is a multicultural microcosm yeah. in, in Asia. Like it's, it's like America in some ways, it's a nation of many different types of people. So there's more, to, I think, more tolerance in some ways in that culture. Um, but, you know, like great rappers aren't necessarily going to come out of great affluence. Um, upwardly mobile, uh, you know, not, not to stereotype Chinese films, but not going to come out of upwardly mobile Chinese American. You know. But there's a great b-boy culture in, in Korea. 
like it's huge there. And I mean, Japan has always had love for hip hop. Um, what do you say? Everything's, Everything's huge there. They, they, they don't do it or they do it real big. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, that's why, you know, most rappers are black or Latino. And then you got some pissed off white kids like Eminem who grew up in a trailer outside eight mile, uh, you know, drive in, uh, in, in Detroit. I know, like, I'm, I listen to, like, a blues artist or something. I go listen to B.B. King sing, and then you listen to some white dude singing the same song. There's no reality feel to it, you know? Like, it's just not there. Right. So well, I feel like even, like, a, a white rapper, like, you know, unless you grew up in the ghetto, you really don't trust that voice, and there's nothing, like, real about it. You know, just don't really, uh... I think there are always exceptions. I think you're generally right. Um, I do think that there are exceptions. through. I don't think you have to be from the ghetto... Uh, to rap well, and I think that's especially, you know, most of the golden era rappers, black rappers, were not from the inner city. They were from Long Island. They were from Jersey. Like, you know, you got this kid like Mac Miller in Pittsburgh or whatever, from the suburb, you know, and he's rapping with the same voice that, like, you know, Biggie Smalls was rapping with or yeah. something, you know? It's like not, I feel like if you can't connect with your reality from it, it's never going to get big. That's why I don't see like a white rapper ever making it or an Asian rapper ever making it. Well, then what do you say about Eminem? Yeah. Vanilla Ice. Okay. Or Beastie Boys. But, you, but I wouldn't put Vanilla Ice and Beastie Boys in the same. Like Beastie Boys rapped who they were. Yeah. They, are, they are products of being city kids in the 1970s and 1980s. Well, you don't think Eminem's a product of his environment? Oh, totally. Yeah, totally. So I think that's why. Um, but I think that there could be somebody from, you know, uh, at 16 Mile Road, Troy, Michigan, there could be, uh, you know, a white rapper coming out of there just as authentically artistic, just different. Um, I don't doubt that that can happen. Um, it's just rarer to see. Uh, I, I get what you're saying. I just, I think he's saying more like, if I were to make a rap album, I'd rap with my voice. I wouldn't, yes. like, Hey, I'm pretending to be Eminem. Yes. That's, that's like what you're saying, right? Like when you hear someone who's like putting on that facade, like, oh, I'm edgy. Yes. Like super streets, but I grew up in a suburb. Authentic to yourself. Yeah. Right. Right. I was just watching that uh, Lonely Island video today for the first time. Did you ever see the one? It was Ross, T what was it? Ross? Ross Trent. Ross Trent. Like the ultimate parody of like, the white Rasta dude who's like so infatuated with Jamaican culture but so terrified of African American culture, <laughs> like, like, has to like sort of get it on import in order for it to be safe enough for him to do it. But he like, d like, that's the ultimate and sort of the parody of the inauthentic white kid. Um, but I don't think that every white kid from the suburbs is necessarily inauthentic. I mean, I'm a white kid from the suburbs. I found my way into hip hop, not through rapping, but through producing um, and through, uh, through writing. Um, so I think that, that you just have to be authentic to yourself and people smell it. You know, I never felt in all my years in hip hop, there were always people who distrusted me, but that was few. I think that the, auth the authenticity of your approach and your love comes through. Um, yeah. Another question. Um, Two people sort of posed the same thing on cult of personality, from, both from John, uh, this one's from John and from Nick, and it's about Russell Simmons, mm. and that uh, it was a, uh, rap was might a small business in back in 84, but Russell had something to do with, you know, almost every piece of music that was released. And did, do, you, do you think that business model will hold today? That is to say, only a few producers make all the hits and top records, and would they open up to having other people with more diverse points of view. And of course, then he said, Russell Simmons, you know, shaping everything. I mean, so, I mean, let's put him in historical perspective right. here for a second. Well, I think we, we went over it a little earlier. The greatest gift that Russell Simmons gave to hip hop and to America was to not 
sell out, to not succumb to the same crossover impulses that, say, other black, older black executives at the time were. Um, they would say, Peebo Bryson, your records are kind of too soulful, too black. We want you to make a nice song called If Ever You're In My Arms Again with a nice lilting melody and strings, and that's what we're going to promote to pop radio for you, if you're good. And Russell Simmons said, F that. Russell Simmons said, I'm not cleaning up my music for anybody. This is rock, this is rock and roll. Um, and Run DMC made that point very clear with rock box, king of rock. Uh, then walk this way. It's like they, they had to actually be so literal with it to the point that Run DMC opened up the doors for folks who didn't have to be so literal. And um, Public Enemy was just as much spiritually in the vein of rock and roll as anything else because it was teen music. So that was Russell's gift, right? Um, I also, th so the, to the other point of, you know, 10 producers producing every 100 records, um, I think that came about as the music became mainstreamed and major labels became, as moneyed interests became more the controlling and dominant factor, those interests tend to favor um, less risky investments. So a less risky investment is, okay, I just signed this artist for a quarter of a million dollars. How do I make sure that one of these records is a hit? Call Timberland, call Pharrell, call Dre, call Premier, whoever, like whoever the hot producer is of the moment. Call Lil John, um, call Puff, but whatever, I, I can't take a chance on this record. I've got, and so the pay rate for those producers went way, way up. And the space for, you know, my man who makes some beats got, got lower. So <clears throat> a question, kind of a good point here, um, <clears throat> where we are this evening. Um, your personal experience, how you became enamored, involved. I mean, how does a white middle class guy from Connecticut become this rap aficionado and and, you know, and then, you know, <clears throat> what is the, f aside from how you got involved, where is rap, hip hop's music in the grand scheme of American pop culture? I'm actually from New York um, and did most of my growing up in Maryland. My father lives in Connecticut. Okay, um, I mean, I was like in Connecticut for like maybe five years when I was five, six, something like that, seven. Um, but I did most of my growing up in between Baltimore and D.C., which had a lot to do with it um, because Baltimore and D.C. are two huge black metropolises that actually have black-owned and oriented media. So if you're growing up as a kid in the suburbs of Maryland, you hear a lot of that. Also, is home to a large black middle-class population. I happen to live in a very special town that didn't exist before 1967. It was America's first fully planned city called Columbia, Maryland. And James Rouse, the same guy who uh, gave you South Street Seaport uh, in Manhattan, he built this town from scratch in 1967, the same year that I was born. And he built it not only to be, he built it to be economically integrated. So there was like Section 8 housing next to market housing, but it kind of looked the same. So because it was economically integrated, it was also more racially integrated. So I happen to have grown up in a really sweet spot. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the Boondocks, Aaron Magruder. He's from Columbia. If you've ever watched CNN, you've seen Suzanne Malveau, um, former White House correspondent, now an anchor. I went to middle school with her. Um, you know, a lot of, it was just a place where like white kids and black kids grew up in, in close proximity and Again, wasn't a racial paradise by any stretch of the imagination, but that's why I could go up listening to soul and funk and a lot of black radio. And so hip hop was just a part of that. It was only like that story I told you earlier when I got to college that, you know, um, I just happened to read Malcolm X that year, the same year that like KRS One came out with, you know, his album By All Means Necessary, and something clicked for me. I'm like, wow, this is really, really important. And I've dedicated my own life to the study of race and culture and politics in America. So that was like the perfect thing for me um, to blend my musicality with, with you know, little politics. And, and so that's, 
how I came into it. And I happened to come into it at a time when it was still young and there was this newsletter out of Harvard called The Source um, that just moved to New York and was trying to become a real magazine and I ended up writing some of the first cover stories for The Source magazine which is still in existence today. Um, and it was just a, a great time. Um, and that's, that's how I got into it. And then the other question was, where, oh, where, did it, where does it fit in the grand scheme of history, pop culture in America? Mm -hmm. Is the future? I think when people look back on this era in American history, you know, the, the, the jump from the 20th to the 21st century, the election of Barack Obama, um, I think that, that people will hopefully begin to understand the role that hip hop culture played in that transition. It was young white Americans who elected Barack Obama. And that generation of young white Americans grew up on hip hop. They weren't, you know, like immersive in black culture like I've been in my life. They didn't work in the hip hop business. They're just, you know, people like you, uh, people like me, you know, um, just average folks. But they grew up on all of this stuff on Beyonce, on Jennifer Lopez, on Jay-Z, on Eminem, uh, House of Pain, Yo! MTV Raps, um, and more than Oprah, more than Cosby, more than Michael Jackson, more than any of the other sort of huge crossover figures that we think of when we think of black achievement and, and you know, movement into the mainstream. Hip hop communicated that message, um, you know, in, in a much more powerful way. And so I think that hip hop is, is playing, ha, did play and is playing a huge role in that transition. It's not as powerful as it once was because hip hop is older and more successful and less able to be that urgent music that's coming up from the bottom. But I'm sure there will be another one. I don't know if it's going to be hip hop or an offshoot of hip hop, but um, that's, that's why I wrote the book and that's how I feel about hip hop. One closing question, very important, whether it's tonight or a future playback of the, of the video here. Um, you're, you're a lot of poor college students here. <laughs> um, this book is going to come out eventually in paperback? Yes, in September. Okay, so it'll be available in paperback in September. So I promised everybody to get out of here at a decent hour. He needs to get back home. I want to thank him for Dan, his time coming here. Thank you for your attention, and let's give him a little... <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Good night.